Buddy this for, conference uh, will now be in. recorded. Um, my name is Rachel Miller. I'm a uh, civil engineer with what we call the Integrated Project Office, uh, specifically for the construction of a new lock in Sault Ste. Marie. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Just want to give you a little bit of uh, background about me. So I, I work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I expect some of you calling in may be familiar with that organization, others maybe not. Um, but basically what that means, I'm a civil engineer. I work for the Department of the Army um, and a organization under that called the Corps of Engineers, which uh, operates, maintains uh, the locks in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, I also serve as the contracting officer's representative on a couple of our contracts here. So you'll hear me talking uh, throughout the presentation about our construction contractors. Uh, the physical construction work is being performed by uh, construction contractors and uh, the office that I work with helps to manage and administer those contracts and that's part of that role. Just a little background about me. I'm not originally from the area. I'm uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, have my, my bachelor's degree in civil engineering uh, from the U.S. Military Academy or, or West Point. Uh, and my master's degree is from Penn State in project management. So I actually came to the Corps uh, just a few years ago from active duty. I was an Army officer uh, where I was an engineer officer. So again, really looking forward to, uh, to speaking with you all. I'm really going to focus the presentation on talking about the construction work that has occurred within the past year. So I'm going to speak about the, uh, the program as a whole. Uh, but really, I, I want to give you an opportunity to, to see what we've been doing over the last year or so uh, and to talk a little bit about what we have coming up next. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And uh, really, if you're going to talk about the, the new lock at the Sioux, you have to talk about the, uh, the Sioux locks. And uh, we, we talk about them as the, the linchpin of the Great Lakes because all of the iron ore that is mined in the upper Great Lakes has to pass through the Sioux locks in order to be uh, transported uh, to the uh, refineries and factories that are on the lower Great Lakes. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's a critical point in that system. And you can see in the, the heat map on that, that graphic on the right, um, that it's, it's really a point where all the, all the vessels have to move through there, which makes it very critical. And uh, if, for those of you who are familiar with the, the visitor center here, you're probably familiar with the uh, Great Lakes freighters. Uh, they're very large vessels. They are the primary means of transportation for that iron ore, uh, and they are basically trapped in the Great Lakes. They're too big to leave. Uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway lock system is, is too small to manage them. So they stay within the Great Lakes system and traverse back and forth transporting that iron ore. And there's a long history uh, of the importance of the Sioux locks and the uh, the United States economy and also the uh, Department of Defense. Uh, so during World War II, you got a fact here, uh, there's 12,000 soldiers that were stationed in Sault Ste. Marie um, because of the criticality that this piece of infrastructure serves uh, within the U.S. Uh, ability to manufacture high strength steel. And so you'll see, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk through a, a timeline of some of the previous locks and when they were built and you'll see that there's actually, there's a pattern where new locks tended to be built during fluctuations of, of need, uh, which tended to coincide with uh, major conflicts and, and wars that the United States was involved with. All right, I like this slide. If you're a lock rookie, um, there's a lot of different types of locks, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, it, it may be confusing to some people depending on how familiar you are. So. Uh, we've got a couple different locks. We like to joke that the three locks are the key to the Great Lakes, and it's a it's a bad pun. Um, but really, a lock is a it's an elevator for boats. That's the easiest way that that you can think of it and describe it. Uh, and and when we look at how Lake Superior lines up with the other Great Lakes, it's not just superior because of its size and its depth. It's also superior because its elevation is higher than the other Great Lakes. So what the lock does is it allows vessels uh, to move up and down that elevation drop of about 21 feet, uh, much like an elevator, and it's fed completely by gravity. That's a, a common question that we get, is how, how do you power the locks? And really, the only thing that we have to power is the, the valves that open 
Uh, and it's just the power of gravity moving from that higher level at Lake Superior into the lock chamber and then down to the St. Mary's uh, River level, which is the same level as Lake Huron, as you see on the right there. All right, so we, we've got some stats, right? So 95% of the U.S. taconite passes through the Sioux locks. That's, that's wild. That is a significant amount, and 88% of tonnage passes through the Po lock. So for folks who are familiar with the lock facility, you know the Po is the only active lock that is capable of locking through the Great Lakes straighters that are about 1,000 feet long, usually about 100 feet wide. So the Po is our largest lock here on the facility. It's also our youngest lock. And when I say young, it's, it's over 50 years old. Uh, so currently, you see on, on the graphic on the right, there's, there's four locks laid out there. From south to north, we have the MacArthur, the Poe, the Davis, and the Sabin. And of those, only two are currently operational, so the MacArthur and the Poe. The Davis and Sabin have been out of commission for quite a few years now. And so we're, we're entirely dependent on the MacArthur and the Poe. And as that graphic shows, 88% of tonnage passes through the Poe lock. So it is really a, a critical point in this system. And it's also an, an aging part of that system. And that estimate of uh, 72 million tons of commodities uh, in the year 2019 uh, passed through the Sioux locks. So again, it's a critical point, And there's only one lock there uh, that's capable of transporting the Great Lakes freighters. So here we have a, uh, a timeline for when uh, some of the locks have been here. And, and you might be thinking, hey, well, slow down. There's only four locks. Why are there so many locks on this list? Uh, and that's because the locks have been built basically on top of each other as they've been replaced. Uh, so there have been locks in Sault Ste. Marie since uh, 1855, which was the, uh, the first lock here. And you can see we've got the, the gaps uh, in the years that each lock was built. So 26 years before they built a new lock, 15 years before they built a new lock. It's always right around 25 years that we tried to build a new lock in the system. But then down at the bottom, you can see the gap between the current Poe lock, which was uh, built in 1968, and the new lock at the Sioux, um, which is currently slated for completion around 2030. So that, that's a gap in 62 years. And, and the reason why I highlight that, uh, when, when design engineers create a design for any, any piece of infrastructure, they, they do so with a design life in mind, which is essentially how long they expect this piece of infrastructure to perform as it's supposed to. Uh, and, and typically, we use about a 50-year design life so that the new lock at the Sioux is built off of a 50-year design life. So we are uh, past that point and moving past it. And uh, something that I know that the folks here in Sault Ste. Marie uh, with the Corps of Engineers work very hard at every winter is maintaining the locks that we do have. So as the locks get older, the amount of time and effort and materials that it takes to just maintain the locks uh, significantly increases. So we're building a new lock at the Sioux. Uh, you might have called in not knowing that, uh, but that's, that's why I'm here. So I work with the office that's going to be uh, responsible for delivering that new lock uh, as part of the facility. So my office oversees the construction associated with uh, the new lock. So here in Sault Ste. Marie, there is a longstanding Corps of Engineers office that operates the locks maintains the locks. They have other responsibilities along the St. Mary's River. Uh, you may have seen there's some, uh, some survey crews there. Uh, they do other construction. That is a long-standing uh, permanent office that's here in Sault Ste. Marie. I'm part of a, a smaller organization that stood up specifically to oversee the construction for this new lock. It has our entire focus. So the new lock is essentially the same dimensions as the PO lock. And we, we get a lot of questions uh, asking, are you going to make the lock bigger? Uh, are you going to try to make the lock better in any way? And something I want to highlight is the importance of having uh, interchangeability between the two locks 
once we have them. So we refer to the new lock as PO 2.0 uh, because it is the same dimensions as the PO. And what that does is it allows us to use certain parts, certain operating techniques, certain maintenance techniques interchangeably. Now, the PO lock was built in 1968. 2022, there are going to be some improvements to the new lock, so I don't want you to worry. We're not going to be building this as if it was 1968, but we are trying to, as much as we can, uh, create that redundancy and interoperability between these two locks. So currently, the, the program for building a new lock is, is organized into three phases. Uh, so the first phase is upstream channel deepening, uh, and that's actually already complete. So uh, that upper graphic on the slide there shows this with respect to time, and then on the bottom it shows it with respect to space. Uh, so the upstream channel deepening, you can see, is already complete, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The second phase, which is the upstream approach walls, is currently ongoing. So phase one and phase two were both geared towards uh, preparing that upper north channel on the upstream end of the lock. Uh, to be able to receive shifts in the new lock uh, once it is built. And then phase three uh, is the, the new lock or the new third lock. And that contract was just awarded earlier this summer. Uh, it's a major contract. It's very exciting news uh, for everyone here in the Sioux and, and honestly for our nation. Uh, and that will be a, a very exciting uh, I hope to have a very exciting update around this time next year in terms of the, the work that we're going to be able to do there. So I'm going to get into a little bit more about the construction that we've done for each of these phases. So for the upstream channel deepening, uh, what I'm showing here is uh, this is survey data. So that north channel, right, there's two locks that were fed by that north channel on the upstream side, the Davis and the Sabin. They're both decommissioned and they had never been large enough to accommodate modern freighters. So they were, they've never been deep enough to accommodate those modern freighters. So we're required to have a channel depth of 30 feet. And in various places in the channel, it was usually about 25 feet uh, below what we call low water datum. Uh, so this contract was a uh, $52.6 million contract uh, which was, uh, the work was performed by Trade West Construction Company, which is a, is a small business out of Nevada. Uh, and they completed that work basically from 2020 up until uh, August earlier this year. So we, uh, we determined that their work was substantially complete as of the 1st of the August, and they have uh, they've demobilized offsite. So we're currently in the process of closing this out. All right. The, so there were some unique challenges associated with this contract work. Uh, namely, you're, so when you're doing construction in water, that always presents challenges. And uh, there's kind of two basic ways that you can go about doing construction in a marine environment, which is you, you work around the water, like you work with it, or you, you try to create a dry environment within the water. Uh, and so Trade West performs this work uh, in the wet, we call it. Um, so they had a floating plant, you can see there on the slide, uh, which is just construction equipment which mount which is mounted on barges and floated out in the, in the channel because of the uh the nature of the bedrock uh in that north channel um they weren't just removing uh soft material they really had to remove uh what we call jacobsville sandstone uh which is the, the prevailing bedrock in in this area so it's an iterative process you can see uh the eccentric ripper on the left there's basically like a very long tooth on, on that piece of machinery, and they would perform an, an iterative pass along the bedrock where they would break up the bedrock and then go back and have to remove that, uh, that material from the channel. So you can see a, a shot there, it's got a combination of the bedrock and then what we call overburden, which is that softer material. Um, I, I do wanna just note the, uh, you sort of see that, that brownish color and I know for anyone who might be calling in who, who's local to the area, we, we got a lot of questions um, really last summer about the, the color of the water um, because some, some folks were concerned uh, there was, uh, the water looks very brown. Uh, we, we joked about it looking kind of like chocolate milk. And that was because uh, in between those layers of bedrock, there's seams of clay. 
And clay is a type of soil material that has a very small, very fine particle size, which means that it, fit, it stays suspended in the water uh, for a long time. It takes a long time to settle out. So uh, that's something I know we, we perform testing to make sure uh, it stayed well within safe limits for like the, the local fish, any wildlife, uh, and, and the water standards that were required to adhere to. Um, but I, I know that's something where the, the type of material being removed really impacted the, the coloring of the water uh, as people were able to observe. So this work was completed uh, last summer, or excuse me, this, this past summer. All right, so phase two is the upstream approach walls, which involves rehabilitating the approach walls uh, upstream of where the new lock is going to be. So the new lock is going to be in the footprint where those two northern locks are. And I, I should have mentioned that the Davis and the Sabin, which are those two older locks being replaced, they were both built in the 19-teens. So they are over 100 years old, and the approach walls associated with them are also over 100 years old. So this contract is a $111 million contract, which was awarded to Kokosing Albarisi, and that is a, a joint venture. Uh, they began work last year, uh, and work is currently ongoing. So I've got a whole bunch of pictures that I'll, I'll talk through some of the ongoing construction work. Uh, you see there on, on the bottom right, uh, that's the, the batch plant, the concrete batch plant that Kokosing Albarisi has constructed directly on site. Uh, one of the unique challenges with this particular construction site is that it's completely isolated from land by the locks facility, right? So the contractor has to mobilize to and from site every day, transporting its equipment and their people to and from shore by boat. Uh, and that makes things very tricky, especially if you're trying to do uh, concrete placement so there's a, a high volume of concrete needed for this work. And also concrete is very sensitive to time. You can't spend a whole bunch of time with your concrete truck sitting on a barge waiting for a freighter to go by uh, or else you'll lose the concrete. It's, it's very, uh, very, very sensitive. Um, so they have a batch plant on site, which really helps to reduce uh, the, the timing issues and also uh, very much puts all of the, uh, the material production uh, for concrete within the control of the contractor. So the upstream approach wall work involves, uh, in certain areas, there's what we call copper cells that are being placed in front of the existing walls. And the best way I can describe a copper cell is it's like a, a basket uh, that you can use in a marine environment, uh, and you can fill it with rocks, or sand or concrete as we, we do in some areas here. Uh, and the circular shape of the copper cell allows for uniform loading uh, of that structure in a circle. So as opposed to a square where you might have edges, which would be a weak point, you've got that circular shape. So copper cells are, are very commonly used in, in marine construction. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna talk you through the process uh, by which we construct those copper cells. So on the left, you can see the uh, steel template used to construct the, the copper cells um, being lifted into the water by a crane right now. Uh, for anyone who's local to the area, you might have seen the, the template. It's, it's currently, I think, on the center pier uh, just west of the International Bridge. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, has been to, to West Pier Drive-In recently, but you can, you can see these from there. Uh, the, the sheet piles, uh, which are long strips of steel, are placed vertically within the template, so just forming that circle around uh, the copper cell. And then from there, uh, you, can, you can fill the cell with uh, aggregate rock, um, sand, concrete. You can see here, uh, we've got an example on the right. This is uh, concrete placement in the cell, and that is a, a very flowable concrete um, that allows it to be placed uh, specifically in, in marine environments. So on the left, you can see uh, the Tremi concrete placement. And again, that's a type of concrete that allows us to place it in an underwater environment um, without having the concrete basically break apart as you try to place it. Okay, so you can see on the, the picture in the left, there's a, 
you can you can sort of see those steel sheet piles sticking up out of the water and then on top of that on top of that copper cell uh, is where we place concrete caps and that's the final flat concrete surface that's going to form the approach wall uh, leading up into the new lock uh, so these are uh, pretty large uh, concrete caps there's 52 in total for the upstream approach wall uh, contract. Uh, you can see in the, the picture on the right really well, this picture was taken from uh, one of the bridges uh, that actually intersects our project site. And you're looking down from above, you can see the amount of uh, reinforcing steel or rebar uh, and also electrical conduit that passes through. So the contractor, when they're preparing to place this concrete, they have to prepare the rebar or reinforcing steel that's that's going in place there. Uh, they've got the conduit in place so that way they can run uh, electrical wires through there after the concrete has been placed. Um, and then the formwork, which is essentially, you can think of it as like a cake pan uh, where you're going to you place your concrete in. So there's a uh, a leapfrogging we call it uh, method that's used for placing the cells which allows them to uh, place every other cell and then go back and refill in the gaps. And that's what you can see in that, that picture on the right. Okay, I have some more pictures here. So the majority of the, the work that has occurred uh, so far, especially in the past year, has been occurring on the north wall of the north channel. So uh, the the picture on the right here is taken from uh, one of the bridges looking to about the northeast. So you can actually see all the way at the top right, that's the power plant right there. And then all the way at the top is Sioux, Ontario. We're looking at Canada in this picture. Um, so there's the majority of the copper cells are on the, the north wall uh, because the new lock is going to be aligned with the same north wall that's currently in place for the Sabin lock. Uh, there's also several copper cells that you see there on the south wall. So those are currently still in progress. Uh, and what that does is it creates a little bit of a, a canalizing point, uh, sort of forces freighters in towards the center of the channel. Um, with modern freighters, what you'll see is some very tall bridges uh, and sort of shaped in uh, almost, I believe they call them a wishbone, uh, where they, they stick out. Uh, vertically and horizontally, uh, much more than, than previous uh, vessels that would have traversed this channel would have. And so those copper cells on either side uh, in vicinity of the bridges forces the, the vessels to go towards the center of the channel and helps keep them from bumping into the railroad bridge, uh, which crosses the channel. And actually, I'll show you that. Right there, you can see on the right. So there is a, a railroad bridge. Um, that, that goes up and down every day, uh, crossing through the project site, and it's at a slight angle. So by having those copper cells there, it, it helps protect the, uh, the vessels as they eventually pass through. Um, Kukosing Albarisi, so the construction contractor has uh, utilized what we call flexi float uh, bridges. It's essentially a, a barge bridge in order to cross the North Channel. And what that does is it allows them to drive their vehicles and their equipment back and forth from the north to south side of the channel. As I mentioned, it's a very challenging uh, construction site just because of the layout. Uh, we are in the middle of a active lock facility with many freighters passing by, not just freighters, but just ships passing through every day. Uh, it's also a very long project site, and you, you can see that from the pictures. It's, it's very stretched out. Um, so being able to use that bridge in order to easily cross between the north and the south sides of the channel uh, has, has been a huge help. Okay, and, and this picture is looking in the, the opposite direction from where we were. So we're actually looking to the northwest here. Uh, you can kind of see a little bit of Canada up at the top there, uh, but we're looking down towards the railroad bridge, and also you can see the, uh, the concrete batch plant that's on site, um, and then the, the rest of the northwest pier there. So. I love this picture because you can see so many of the elements that are at play uh, in in this particular part of the project. Uh, and something I, I really want to highlight is uh, Kukosi Albarisi has 
uh, coordinated extensively with both uh, CN Railroad, which is the entity that, that owns and operates the, the railroad bridge, and also the International Bridge Authority, which is directly overhead uh, where this, this picture was taken to ensure that they've uh, been able to conduct this con very critical construction work uh, in and around these sensitive areas where the bridge abutments are. Uh, so they've done a fantastic job of, of communicating with those entities and with doing proper planning uh, to ensure that when they're using cranes or when they're uh, using barges in and around those areas that we're, we're keeping all the infrastructure safe. And here's another great picture. I love this one on the right with the, with the cranes. Uh, and that is directly underneath the international bridge that connects Sioux, Michigan to Sioux, Ontario. All right. So in this past year, uh, we've, we've progressed from that, that picture that you see all the way on the left uh, to the right. So we are uh, really nearing completion for the, the copper cell caps that I mentioned earlier. So there's a total of 52 copper cells uh, on the project. Um, currently, uh, I believe it's 42. 41 that are currently in place um, and, and getting very close. So you can really see the uh, the wall start to take shape there. And again, uh, one, one of the um, elements of this construction work is that the copper cells are being placed in front of the existing wall. There was no removal of the old wall. Um, these copper cells are just placed in front of uh, the old existing wall. So it actually, it narrows the channel slightly. Uh, and, and sometimes people ask, hey, does, does that cause a negative impact on, on the ability to pass ships? Um, to which I say no, because where there used to be two locks that were fed by this north channel, there's only one. So the expectation is that at least east of the, of the bridges, that canalizing point, there's, really, there's only going to be one vessel at a time crossing through that area. You can also see uh, in the pictures the, uh, the color of the water change. Uh, so in, in May 2022, that, that water looks pretty brown, and that's because the upstream channel deepening contractor was still on site performing their, uh, their deepening work and kick, basically kicking up that clay material uh, in the water so that you had suspended solids in the water giving it that brown color. And then in August, July, August, September, the water has just gotten bluer. Uh, as we uh, as we concluded that excavation work. Okay, so that's a uh, that's a highlight on uh, phase two, which has been that's been the majority of the construction work that's been performed uh, in the last year. <clears throat> Excuse me, that work is still ongoing, uh, probably for a, another year. Um, I'm, I want to talk a little bit about phase three, which is the, the new lock contract, um, and and this is the largest contract currently in the, in the program, um, and this is to construct that replacement lock uh, in the footprint of what is now the Sabin lock, which is, as I said, decommissioned. Um, this contract also includes some additional features, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so the base con contract was awarded to Kokosi Albarisi Trailer, uh, which is a joint venture, on the 1st of July, and that's valued at 1.068 billion dollars. Um, so you might be thinking to yourself, Kokosing and Albarisi sounds familiar. The, the parent companies are the same. This is a separate joint venture and, and considered a separate contractor for this work. Uh, so the um, proposals were evaluated over the course of um, several months, uh, really earlier this year, and uh, was awarded to Kokosing Albarisi trailer earlier this summer. So that's about five years of work there. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with um, contracts and, and the idea of base and options, uh, it's essentially base is a certain amount of the work with the ability to award options uh, at, at later times. So there are other portions of the work um, that we expect to be added on uh, over time. And that is, that's very common for large civil works construction uh, and for um, federally funded projects. So the remaining options are valued at an additional $803.95 uh, million. Um, and again, 
those are expected to be awarded over the course of the next several years. Uh, so we're very excited. So Composing Alvarisi Trailer is um, working on building their team. They're mobilized to, this, to Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, they're currently working on their pre-construction requirements. I do expect that they're going to start <clears throat> uh, getting out and performing work within the next month or so. We have a whole lot of work that we have to do before the contractor is, is even allowed to begin work. So things like planning for how they're going to keep workers safe, planning for how they're going to conduct their schedule, making sure that we've got the materials, checking our engineering designs. There's a whole lot of um, not just paperwork, but, but brain work that goes in uh, before anyone is, is ready uh, to mobilize to site. But we are very excited because they are, uh, they're right on the cusp of, of getting there. Um, so right now, the estimated contract completion is summer 2030. As I said, the uh, currently awarded base has about five years of work, and then the additional options include some additional time in there as well. So this new lock consists of <clears throat> a, a lock that's uh, built much like the Poe, right? So 12,000 feet by 110 feet. And then there's some additional elements uh, that are a little bit new here. So there's uh, some rehabilitation for the pumping system associated with all of the locks, not just the new lock. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the locks facility, you know that maintenance is done when the shipping shuts down, which is the middle of January to March. Uh, it's very cold, which means that if you want to dewater the locks and remove the water, you have to be able to remove that water very quickly before it freezes or else you end up having to chip away or, or melt the ice in order to be able to get at those surfaces. So that pump well is going to be a critical piece of this project work. We're also incorporating uh, hands-free mooring, which is a, a new technology. It's currently in place in the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, has not been used in the, in the Sioux Locks facility yet. So this is going to be a, a first for the Sioux Locks. Okay, and, and the, uh, the project work that's here occurring here in the Sioux uh, really has some, some pretty significant impacts both at a local level and then uh, much more broadly. So the, uh, you can see uh, just in terms of jobs created, so direct jobs, uh, indirect jobs, and then in induced jobs, which is essentially, um, you know, looking at jobs that are created as a second order impact. Um, there's also a significant amount of materials uh, that are going to go into this project work. Uh, and I, I know um, living here in the Sioux, uh, the locks are a absolutely critical piece of really the identity here. Uh, I know we've received a whole lot of support from the, the local community, uh, as well as more broadly, um, support from uh, people across Michigan and honestly across the United States. Uh, so it's really a, a privilege to be able to work on this project uh, with my team, uh, with the team from uh, both contractors that are, are currently still working with us. Um, we really look forward to uh, to delivering this project. Uh, and hopefully I will have some very exciting updates for you about this time next year. Thank you, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> I, I never trust the technology. Let me get my screen shared and we'll give people a few minutes to enter their questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, while you give you a chance to put in your questions, I'll just highlight our current visitor center hours right now. The uh, Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center in Duluth is open Thursday through Mondays, 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And they still have that cell phone tour available outdoors, the online gift shop and the uh, online virtual tour. And at the Sioux Locks, we have uh, finally hired enough park rangers that we are now able to be open daily. Uh, the park is open from 9 to 9. The visitor center is open every day from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m., at least through the end of October. And, of course, you can call that boat uh, schedule hotline uh, every day of the week to get estimated arrival times for vessels that will be passing through the Sioux Locks. And we have a couple questions coming in for Rachel. 
uh, someone was asking about what's going to happen with the Davis lock um, since the Sabin is being replaced. Yes, and I, I see there's another question related to the Davis as well, so I'm going to try to answer those both at the same time. Uh, so both the Sabin and the Davis um, are narrower than the new lock will be. Uh, so the new lock is going to basically line up on the north wall of the Sabin lock, which is the northernmost lock. Um, if you're looking at the, uh, the picture on the slide right now, um, basically the leftmost lock uh, while you're looking forward. But we're going to have to cut in, essentially, uh, to that center pier because the lock is going to be wider. So there's not enough space uh, to place another lock. So no, there will not be an additional lock. So rather than four locks in total on the facility, there's going to be three. Uh, now, to answer your question about the what's going to happen to the Davis lock, uh, it is going to be filled in. So um, th something that's interesting here is that the water in the lock actually helps to hold the walls up. Right, which people don't always necessarily think about. Um, but it, in the course of construction, we're actually going to have to remove some of the soil that's behind the walls and help brace those walls, which are very old, before we're able to remove the water. Because in doing, like, if, by removing the water, you, you're removing a, a pressure on one side of the wall and you present some structural uh, stability concerns. So it's going to be a bit of a process. It's not quite as simple as we're just going to fill it in. Um, but yes, the Davis lock is going to be filled with material in the course of this construction. And then uh, someone was asking why they haven't lengthened the new lock for bigger ships. Okay, and I, I know that this was um, certainly part of the discussion for the design. Um, I'd also say, and I didn't mention this earlier, uh, this design has been in the works for, for quite some time. It was back in the, the late 80s when this new lock was authorized. And I'm not gonna tell you how old I was in the late 80s when this lock was authorized, but um, so there, there's been a, there has been part of the discussion. Um, but really what we're looking for is a, uh, not redundant, but resilient lock that will allow that interoperability between the PO and the new lock. Because again, one of the concerns is the PO is also getting older. Um, and so things like the miter gates uh, take potentially years to fabricate uh, and to move and, and to place. Uh, and, and so that machinery and those components, there's a, there's a lot of advantage to be had in using the same dimensions uh, really wherever possible. So um, I don't necessarily have all the answers in terms of the design decisions and, and how and why uh, that came to be the decision, but that's my understanding in terms of uh, some of the advantages of having a lock that is the same size as the existing PO lock. Uh, one of the things we note to visitors in the visitor center about that also is we don't want them to make longer boats because you know when the when the PO lock opened a lot of boats that used to fit in the MacArthur lock got cut in half and lengthened to the new max or at least to a new, a much bigger size so that now they are only dependent on the PO. And they're, you know, they can kind of see there could be a concern that they would start making more of these boats bigger and we're in the same situation we're in now, 50 years from now, where everything has to pass through one lock. And someone else asked, what will be the name of the new lock? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer yet. I, that will be determined, I believe, once the, uh, the lock is constructed. I believe and it's determined by Congress. Yeah, traditionally, Congress picks their names. And at the Sioux, most of them have been named for uh, district commanders or very famous World War II generals. And uh, someone was commenting, I was there just recently and they had trouble closing one of the Poe gates. Is there a planned replacement for Poe given its age? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And even from now in 2022 to 2030, a, a lot could change in terms of the condition of either of the two existing locks. Um, the answer is not yet. Uh, I, I do think that there is a plan for some extended maintenance for the PO once there's a new lock in place. And what I mean by that 
is right now all the maintenance that occurs for both of the uh, current operational locks and especially the PO because it is that larger lock. Um, all of that has to happen during that winter maintenance shutdown. And so there's only so much that you can do over that relatively small period of time. It's just a couple months. Um, and also, it's the middle of the winter time. It's very cold here. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do certain types of, of repairs uh, in, in the winter time. Uh, so in terms of a replacement, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't think that has uh, really entered into the, the works yet. Uh, I will say I, there's a very good chance that the PO is going to get a, a bit of a rest once the, the new lock is in operation. So that way they're able to do some, some more lengthy maintenance uh, to, to keep it running. And uh, someone had a question for us um, is if the recording will be available. And we do plan to post the recording online. Uh, they have changed the format of the recording. So it might take a little bit of time for me to get all of that converted because computer magic is not my special skill. But it will be posted to our YouTube page when we manage to get that accomplished. And I will post a link to the, our YouTube channel uh, in just a second. And um, another question, will one lock be used for upbound vessels and the other for downbound vessels? So usually the answer that I give to this kind of question is take all instructions from the lock master. Um, I, I don't believe that's the intent. It's actually, um, it's, it's not as efficient to do so because you end up having to cycle the lock uh, if you're going to do that, right? So let's say that one lock is just doing up-down vessels. You're gonna have to go from low pool with that vessel to high pool. And then in order to bring in the next vessel, you've gotta go back down to low pool again. Um, so in some cases, it's actually more efficient to have two-way traffic uh, than one-way traffic. But again, I, I'd say, under all circumstances, take instructions from the lock master. Um, but no, I, I don't believe that's the intent. And then Paul is asking if there will be another observation point for visitors at the new lock. In terms of a, a physical observation point, I, I don't know yet. I will say there's, um, there's planning in place for uh, aerial footage and then also um, some some footage from the construction project and that's all part of that new lock contract so we're still in the planning phase with the contractor as to how we're going to do that um, but there's I, I would say you can expect to see lots of imagery um, some some streaming uh, and and possibly some other observation points one of the tricky things with uh, with this particular construction project, is we're in the middle of a existing facility, right? Um, so we've got to be able to work around uh, the vessel traffic. And that's one of the things that we prioritize is making sure that we're not interrupting vessel traffic and also trying not to interrupt power uh, from the hydropower plant. So uh, for observations, um, I don't know yet. I will say uh, at, at the very least digitally, there will certainly be the opportunity. And if you're if you're asking about an observation platform like the one beside the Mac lock, I, I really doubt that because I don't see how security could facilitate taking people across the MacArthur lock, which is still an active lock and onto the facility. But in the visitor center, we will definitely be doing what we can to keep everybody apprised and informed about the project and provide visuals when we have them. And I had a question that I thought someone would ask, but they didn't, so I'm gonna just ask it. Um, is phase three, the, the work for phase three, like the demolition of the Sabin and um, the construction, is that gonna be done in the wet or is that gonna be done in the dry? Will they be putting some sort of dams across the approach? That's a great question. Uh, some of it's going to be done in the wet. Um, most of it's going to be done in the dry. Uh, so there's going to be uh, copper dams that are placed uh, across the ends of the locks um, and then the water is going to be pumped out. And one of the challenges is, uh, well, I'm going to assume that a bunch of you probably live or are familiar with Michigan. Groundwater is a, it's a problem if you don't deal with it, right? It'll, it'll come and it'll find you. So it's not just about pumping out the, the river water. We also have to be able to maintain the groundwater 
around that area. So the construction work for the new lot is going to involve not just creating that dam and pumping the water out, but maintaining that because you're, you'll get seepage uh, through any of the voids in the material surrounding the lot uh, if you don't do so. So there's some pretty extensive grouting uh, involved for this uh, contract work. And, and there's going to have to be some pretty active pumping in order to manage that. But yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. I never thought about the groundwater part. That, that it certainly sounds like a complicated process. And I think that we're running to the end of our questions. So I'm going to real quick do another teaser for next month, uh, November. Great month to do shipwreck stories. We'll have Rick Mixter. Um, we have the link for that. And I'm going to paste it into the chat if you want to save it for later, but we will have an event posted on our Facebook page and we'll share it as widely as we're able to before that program on November 3rd. And with that, um, I'll just put our, our information here that has a lot of the links that uh, I was pasting into the chat. And I'm going to also put one more time the link to our survey. Uh, we really do pay attention to that and we are always interested to see we know what programs we're interested in we're interested to see what programs our audience is interested in and thank you all of uh, you for joining us and thank you very much rachel for taking time out of your day to bring us all up to speed on this project and i will have this recording posted to youtube as soon as, as, soon as i figure out the magic or, or find a, a magician who is able to convert the files into the right media for us and thank you all once again. Thank you for having me. No problem.